Okay, so we're back. Um, how did you get on? The difficulty that many people face at this point in time is that they understand at this, this stage that we're not talking about a cosmetic makeover. But what is it that we're really going to try to do and what is the real problem that, we're ha that we have to solve? The business price busters went through a few years of kind of denying the truth. They didn't want to reconsolidate their warehousing. They didn't want to sack a fleet of truck drivers. They didn't want to get rid of the sales force, if that's what your plan is. They looked at acquiring KitchenAid and KitchenAid said, no, I think we'd actually try and acquire you. So there was no love lost between the two businesses and no point in them continuing discussions about some sort of merger and reconciliation. So the question then comes, what are you going to do? And at this stage, most people say, well, we're going to have to change our warehousing to match that of KitchenAid. We're going to have to get in overnight delivery. So we're going to invest in loads of new trucks. Um, we're going to open to trade in public. And actually, we're just simply going to mimic KitchenAid. Pricebuster did most of that. And the needle didn't move. Nothing changed. And actually, when we know the theory behind this and the theory behind disruption, we'll understand that why this didn't change. Clay Christensen has written a book. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma. It's back from the, the late 1990s. It's really before the digital economy truly shot into the uh, stratospheric growth phase that it's in now. And what Christensen says is that the incumbents have this sustaining trajectory. In other words, they, the prime players, as we have in our, in, in our seven principles, the big player, the prime players, when they have a roll on, they continue to roll. The line that we can see, they he they're heading towards the high end mainstream market. It's the most profitable area because they want to service the bigger customers with more profitable goods and services. The mainstream market, you can see the line cutting through here. There is a point in time where the products and services you offer don't really matter about how much further higher up the scale you go. The incumbent sustaining trajectory cuts through the line of mainstream. At that point, the customer just doesn't care if your knives are sharper, if your plates are prettier, if your detergents are bubblier. They just don't care. Your delivery is faster. They just don't care. The, you're solving problems for the mainstream that for the high-end market that the mainstream don't have. This opens up a gap at the bottom end, the low end of the market. And this is where new market entrants tend to come in for, into. The new market entrants that we've seen in the previous slides were that KitchenAid came in and went for both public and the business-to-business -business community. And that has a huge impact. They sought a new customer base that weren't being serviced by the higher end providers. They got in at that lower end and worked their way up and caused disruption to the incumbent. Price busters. So price busters then got displaced. But as KitchenAid now becomes the incumbent, price busters cannot mimic them and regain their title. So what are they to do? Well, the, the problem then centralizes around, if mimicking doesn't work, do we really need to centralize our warehousing? Do we really need to sack our fleet of vans and trucks on the road? Do we really need to go and open up to trade in public? If we do, and we know from this case study that it doesn't work, just competing head to head with an incumbent won't work. So then the next natural question is, should we innovate? And then when we start to innovate, you'll realize not all innovations are equal. Not all innovations carry the same weight. Let me explain. If the incumbent, the largest player in the field, sees an innovation and they like the innovation, they'll copy it. So the smaller business that's trying to innovate their way against the incumbent is simply paying 
for their R&D. Let's take a look at some examples. What Christensen mentions in his book is that there's two types of innovation, sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. Here is Xerox. They made the photocopier. The photocopier wasn't the best, according to Hewlett Packard or IBM, because they came in and made faster copiers. They made better staplier copiers, bendier copiers, better quality copiers. What did Xerox do? Well, they copied them. They were a copy company. Sorry, forgive me. The point is that no amount of bullets fired by IBM or HP could displace Xerox because they simply took the innovations that those guys created and incorporated them into the next iteration of their product. They had the brand warmth to continue being the number one player. So who then disrupted the marketplace for Xerox? The answer was Canon. This little copier came along. It was poorer quality. It couldn't bend, it couldn't staple. Um, it smelt, it sat at the end of your table, but it was more affordable, and more effective and more convenient and appealed to a different audience. The point of this is, is that if we're going to make price busters beat KitchenAid, we can't make sustaining innovations. We can't just do what they're doing slightly better because they will win the game. We, we could do it if we had the size and scale. So you may turn around and say, well, we're part of a listed company. I want to invest hundreds of millions to take these guys on. But a more shrewd way would be to actually look for disruptive innovation. And the leadership need to guide that. The strategy needs to guide that. I'm going to let you pause for a second, take that in, and I'm then going to tell you what the outcome was that allowed Price Busters to beat KitchenAid in this circumstance. It's interesting. You'll want to tune in. Okay, this is the big reveal. I mentioned earlier that there are three hallmarks for disruption. According to Christensen, if something becomes more affordable, more effective and more convenient, people tend to go to it. And this is what happened. The KitchenAid were able to create a scenario where they were distributing catalogs and not sales reps. They were able to offer lower prices. They were able to make it more effective so that the person could order at time of need, which also made it more convenient uh, because the deliveries then came in quick succession. The the problem with emulation of that scenario is that we know that they will just take the competitive advantages that we would create and they would emulate it. We also know from the seven principles of digital business strategy that we have to know what we want. We have to know what the marketplace has, which we're now competing, or the two competitors, KitchenAid and Price Busters. But no one, any time I'm giving this as a presentation, no one ever asks, what does the customer want? They think because the customer chose the KitchenAid solution that the customer is wedded to the KitchenAid solution. But KitchenAid solution was diagnosed 10 years previously. At a trade show, we turn up with clipboards and ask the customer, if I made an app that allowed the chefs to order a time of need and it took the need away from meeting me, Mr. A hotel Manager, would you use it? I don't really care, I thought you had that. What if we were to consolidate our warehousing and bring you many more products? Would you use that? Anything I really need, your sales reps can get for me. What if we brought next day delivery? Well, to be honest, I'll just ring your sales rep, Brian, and he gets it to me quickly. As the business was about to redevelop what it does and how it does it, it then realizes when you ask the customer, the pain points of the customer are just expectations now. The old pain points are simply expectations. And moving into that model, whilst yes, it will help match their expectations, they already thought that we kind of did match the expectation. We need to change the game. The game needs to be played in a different way if we're going to make this work. Here's the shortcut answers to what happened. There's a much longer winded version of this, but I'm sure your coffee's getting cold. When we asked the customer further about what their pains were, they said, we find removal of waste is getting very expensive. 
it's difficult to uh, pay the energy bills. They tend to be incredibly high for our commercial kitchens. We find it difficult to be able to set up for the morning, have a large crowd in at lunch, and then have everything prepared and ready for a banquet in the evening. And they, we find it difficult to recruit staff because they go to the newest, cleanest kitchen. We find it difficult to meet the health uh, regime targets because we're constantly having to clean surfaces. We have, they're inundated with problems, just not problems that we fix. So the business got together and said, how could we fix the customer's problem? How could we make the big energy costs, which are anything up to about six thousand pounds, about ten thousand US dollars per month, how could we decrease that? How could we get them greater throughput from their kitchens? And as I'd mentioned in previous videos, they happen to have a kitchen design company. But the kitchen design company does not know how to answer energy cost needs. How much does a three hundred watt fridge use versus a hundred and seventy five watt? Who can translate that into proper language? Stuff that business need, business cost. So we need to collaborate with people, with the manufacturers of equipment. We need to collaborate with those who can do solar panels, wind uh, energy creation. We need to collaborate with those who understand tax and carbon tax credits. We need to understand who can, how we can better handle waste and waste management. We need to understand how we can get greater throughput and even collaborate with recruiters to understand what chefs are looking for. The business does this and comes up with a minimum viable product. A three page brochure that says, if you pay your electricity, your power bills, to me, your power and gas bills, I reckon I can reduce the cost of your kitchen running costs by 50% and I can improve your throughput, I can improve your staff retention, I can reduce your waste costs, I can take all of that pain away from you and I will give you a free kitchen. You just have to pay me the energy costs that you have been paying. I give you a free kitchen and we'll install it. This meant that they were going to be able to go out and say to all hotels, a free kitchen was going to come your way and all you had to do was keep paying the same energy bills. Oh, and one caveat. I need you to sign up for a five year deal to buy all of your commodity stuff that you have been buying from KitchenAid from us. That's it. Within four or five meetings with four or five larger hotels, they said, this is a no-brainer. When do we sign it? Where do we go? The brochure was enough to test the idea. It then took a further 18 months to develop the idea through each iteration and stage and get those five hotels bedded in and understand the business model and then train the sales reps to get out on the road and start saying, I can massively reduce your kitchen costs. After three years, you will have half the energy costs. You will have a brand new kitchen and you will solve all of these problems and just sign up for the five year deal to buy lowest price guaranteed by the kitchen commodities from us. They now can't keep up with the kitchen installations that have to happen. They're now the go-to people when it comes to creating new intellectual ways of being able to run a business much more efficiently. They've changed the game, leveraging the pivot points that multiply their effectiveness of effort. My closing summary of this is, any digital transformation that we go into that yields success typically has some kind of significant change that happens to the business in order to win and compete better in the digital economy. Yeah, for sure we need to make operational efficiency, but operational efficiency does not address the core issue of creating new business products, new services, leveraging the pivot points that can multiply the effectiveness of effort, diagnosis, guiding policy, and looking at the short-term problems that must be overcome if we're to reach the long-term vision and goals. When we set out these new plans, it makes us a terrific place to work. We tend to get much greater engagement from customers. It reinvigorates the business and gives it new potential, even though it also gives it new risk. But my opinion is staying where they were was the greatest risk of all. Thanks for watching.